Our Father, we come to study your word expectantly this morning, eager to hear your voice. We pray that by your spirit you would apply your word to our hearts and lives, that you would encourage us, challenge us and shape us into the people you would have us be. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. During the week I came across this quote by Paul Washer, a pastor in the US. He says, You ask me, what is the greatest act of faith? To me, it is to look in the mirror of God's word and see all my faults, all my sin, all my shortcomings, and to believe that God loves me exactly as he says he does. He makes a good point. We may be able to hide, to some extent, who we are to other people, but before the God of the universe, we stand completely exposed. His word pairs back all our defences and all our fabricated ideas of who we are. And it's a very humbling, very vulnerable place to be. The Israelites discover this in Nehemiah 8 and 9. Last week we heard how after the wall of Jerusalem had been completed, the returned exiles came together in the city and asked Ezra to read to them the book of the law. They came expectantly, they came intentionally, and from daybreak until noon, Ezra read God's word and explained it to them so they could understand. And the people's response was to weep. The reading of God's word was like a mirror being placed before them in which they could see and understand their true nature. The gravity of their sin cut them to the core and they were humbled in grief. Now in chapter 8 it was a day to celebrate God's goodness rather than to grieve over sin and so Ezra encouraged the people along those lines But in their initial response, we see what happens when the Spirit of God applies the Word of God to our hearts, where we gain those remarkable insights into the absolute holiness, perfection, splendour and power of our God, his immeasurable love and goodness, justice and mercy, faithfulness and forbearance. And when we gain insight into how radically short of the mark we fall. Now we're all built differently. Some of us may be acutely aware of some of our sin and and tend to dwell upon it. Perhaps even to the point where we become bound by self-pity. Others of us will be at the other end of the spectrum, hardened to our sin, dismissive of it and quick to self-justify. Neither is right. But perhaps more of us tend to fall towards that latter end of the spectrum where our pride blinds us to the gravity of our sin, the true depth of the wickedness of our hearts. We don't like to think about it. Our instinct is to deny it or at least ignore it. Yet each and every one of us is thoroughly corrupt with a nature that rages against the God of the universe wanting nothing more to displace him from his throne and instate ourselves as ruler of our own lives instead. Each one of us in our pride wants to be the authority over our circumstances, our choices, our relationships, over every aspect of our lives. And each one of us in our pride, when left to our own devices, We'll use every trick in the book to worm our way out of that place of stark conviction. Because true conviction of our sin, true understanding of our own wicked nature is deeply humbling and deeply painful. It leaves the truth of who we really are completely exposed. When we come to see ourselves clearly in the mirror of scripture, We are cut to the core with grief over our moral filth and pride and absolute inability to make ourselves clean. And by nature, we don't want to go there. We'd like to believe that we're really not that bad. I was playing with a friend's dog last weekend, a pure white Malamute with the most beautiful, thick double coat of fur. 
Her coat was so thick that dust and dirt can't get all the way in. So when you parted her fur, you revealed this pristine woolly undercoat, so spotless and clean. And you realise that the white outer coat was actually probably a little off-white. The comparison is stark. And it's like that with us. We like to think of ourselves as pretty good, pretty righteous, pretty respectable. But compared to the radiant goodness of our God, his absolute holiness and perfection, we are black with sin. In the mirror of scripture, of God's revelation of himself, the true horror of our sin is laid bare. All pride and illusions are stripped away and we are left with the inescapable reality that we are utterly undone. And this is what we see in chapter 9. Three weeks or so after they first gathered to hear God's word, the people gather again. But unlike in chapter 8, now is the time to reflect upon the depth of their sin, confessing it before God and repenting. Verse 1, on the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshipping the Lord their God. The Israelites gathered uh, fasting and wearing sackcloth, rough and itchy garments made from goat hide that signified confession of sin and repentance, and with dust on their heads, a sign of mourning. They came itchy, dirty, and hungry, completely humble, not exactly your average Sunday morning. Their outer appearance mirrored what was going on in their hearts, deep grief over their sin against God and with a desire to turn back to him. Israelites stood separately from foreigner, a reflection of God's decree that Israel was to be holy and set apart from other nations belonging to God alone. And for a quarter of the day, they stood and listened to the word of God being read out, And for another quarter, they confessed their sins and worshipped God. Three hours reading the word and three hours responding to it. If we resist the thought of spending six hours with God, as I'm sure most of us do, in fact, some of us probably felt our Bible reading this morning was a little bit too long. If we resist the thought of spending considerable time with God, It's worth asking ourselves why. What have we placed before him? What have we allowed to become more important in our lives than God? Heaven forbid we've made our lives so busy, so centred on self, that we've pushed God to the margins. After their time of listening to the word, confessing their sin and worshipping God, The Levites command the people to stand together and praise the Lord their God who is from everlasting to everlasting. And what follows is a remarkable prayer, either by the Levites or perhaps by Ezra, but a prayer that remembers the astonishing goodness and faithfulness of God throughout history, how truly awesome he is in all that he has done, all that he has made, and all that he is. Every verse of this prayer that we heard read out is a quote from scripture, and it shows us just how saturated with God's word those who prayed were. They had read God's word and allowed it to sink into the very centre of their being, to absorb its truth, meditating on it, depending on it, and allowing it to shape their response to God. And we learn so very much about our God from this prayer. He is the one and only God worthy of all praise. He is the God who created all things, supreme over all creation, things visible and invisible, 
the giver of life and the subject of heaven's worship. He's the God who chose a people for himself, electing Abraham and making a covenant with him, promising him innumerable descendants and a fertile land. He is the God who heard the distress of his people in Egypt and rescued them, saving them from slavery under Pharaoh in miraculous fashion. He is the God who led his people through the desert, providing for their physical needs, giving them laws to keep them walking in life-giving paths and filling them with his spirit to instruct them. He is the God who gave them the promised land, who fought against their enemies time and time again, who delivered his people time and time again, who raised leaders and prophets to guide and warn them time and time again. He's a God who disciplines his people, but never abandons them. We see in this prayer our God of unimaginable might and power, wisdom and righteousness, the great deliverer and the great defender of his children, ever holy, ever just, merciful, compassionate, patient and forgiving, slow to anger and abounding in love, never leaving nor forsaking, never failing, the God of absolute faithfulness and indescribable goodness. Our God is an awesome God. How could the subjects of his love ever turn against him? How could they ever reject him or blaspheme against him or despise him? How could they keep from singing his praise or walking in his ways or shining his light to the nations around them? Yet the people of God respond with arrogance and stiff necks. They disobey. They refuse to listen. They fail to remember. They rebel against God time and time again. They worship idols. They commit awful blasphemies. They turn their backs on God's law. They kill his prophets who were sent to warn them. They do what is evil in his sight time and time again. When they're in distress, oppressed by their enemies, they cry out to God. They need to turn away again once he's delivered them. It should make us sick to the stomach that they would treat their God with such contempt, with such arrogance and irreverence. Could you imagine ever taking the one true God for granted like that? Ever rejecting him to chase after those things that we know never satisfy? Perhaps... Just perhaps we are not so very different. The Israelites turn from the God of heaven, the God who saves them, the God of love and grace and unimaginable goodness for the lure of sinful desires, time and time and time again. And the consequences have been great. Here in chapter 9, the reality of their sin hits home. They remember the extravagant goodness of God and see clearly who they are in comparison. We see a people humbled and contrite, grieving over their sin and that of their forefathers, lamenting its consequences which they continue to endure and coming before God in confession. Verse 33, In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous, You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. Our kings, our leaders, our priests and our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the statutes you warned them to keep. Even when they were in your kingdom enjoying your great goodness, the great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. But see, we are slaves today, slaves in the land you gave our ancestors so they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you've placed over us. 
They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. Their collective sin had seen them exiled. The temple destroyed in Jerusalem, reduced to rubble. 70 years as, uh, in a foreign land as, as slaves to other nations. And even now, though they're back in the promised land, with a new temple and the city walls rebuilt, it is but an echo of the prosperity that the people once enjoyed. They're still under foreign rule. The best of their crops and livestock are taken from them and the throne of David sits empty. We are in great distress. This is the bitterness of sin. It promises the world but leaves us empty-handed. It robs us of joy and hope and even of life itself. And there's no way to dig ourselves out of the pit of sin. As we reflect on the people's prayer on how good God had been to them throughout the generations and how wickedly they'd acted in response, our human sense of justice tells us that they deserve what they got. That the story of God's people should have ended there. In humility and contrition, forever suffering the consequences of their sin. But if we condemn them, we condemn ourselves too. For are we really any different? Have we not also experienced the extravagant goodness of our God in our lives? Have we not also been given life by him, enjoyed his beautiful creation, had his breath in our lungs and his provision on our tables, experienced joy in the people he's brought into our lives, even if they were with us for too short a time, seen his blessings in the sunshine and the rain, in the pattern of the seasons, in new life and in the wisdom of years, in a hug, in a smile, in a kind word, in his sustaining grace and protection from harm, in his presence with us and his hand that guides us, in his word that gives us hope and grounds us in truth. Have we not also experienced the goodness of God in our lives? And have we not also turned away? I wonder if our sin distresses us like it did the Israelites. I wonder if we grieve over our sin, over our pride and the hardness of our hearts, at the way we take God for granted, at our thanklessness and prayerlessness, the way we criticise others and yet cut ourselves so much slack, at our lack of empathy and generosity, at our toxic self-absorption, how we too so often reject the one true God, the spring of living water, and dig for ourselves broken cisterns, chasing after everything but the way, the truth, and the life. And we, too, deserve to suffer the consequences of our sin. And the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from our God of goodness. Sin is never trivial. It's never something to be excused or downplayed or celebrated like the culture around us does. Sin is deadly, and we humans are unable to deal with it in and of ourselves. But there is hope. The Israelites, in their distress, cast themselves upon the mercy of God. They knew he was a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, faithful to his covenant promises. The very goodness of God that they had so often rejected was also their only hope that if they confessed their sins and truly repented, God would forgive them and cleanse them and restore them. And he did. And the goodness of God is our great hope also, But how much richer is our understanding of his goodness this side of the cross? 
When we reflect upon the depth of our sin, we cry out with Paul in Romans 7, what a wretched people we are. Who will rescue us from these bodies that are subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers us through Jesus Christ our Lord. At the cross, Jesus took upon himself our sin and in his death he paid the price for all of it. The punishment we deserved was placed upon him and he atoned for our sin completely and finally. How awesome is our God. You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For those who believe in Jesus, our debt has been paid. Because of him, we've crossed from death to life and life everlasting. And though we continue to sin, though we stumble and fall time and time and time again and will until we breathe our last, we place our hope upon the goodness of God that if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is the amazing hope of those who believe in Jesus. And this is the astonishing goodness of our God, that he made a way for us to be reconciled to him, that our sins are forgiven, that we are clothed in the righteousness of his precious son, our saviour, Jesus Christ, and that we have the hope of eternity with him. Thanks be to God, who delivers us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.